And our opening words this morning are by Jack Mendelssohn. Here in this sanctuary of ancient dreams and wisdom and beauty, we come to grow, to be healed, to stretch mind and heart, to be challenged, renewed, to be helped in our own continuing struggles for meaning and for love, to help build a world with more justice and mercy in it, to be counted among the hopers and the doers. Here we invite the spirit of our own humanity and the healing powers under, around, through, and beyond it to give us the nerve and grace, the toughness and sensitivity to search out the truth that frees and the life that maketh all things new. Spirit of life, our hearts are full this morning. Help us to feel each thing. Help us to give each emotion its due space. We feel joy. We are joyful that marriage equality has become a reality for so many states this week. We celebrate with couples across the country whose love is being honored at last. We are heartbroken at the spread of Ebola and the loss of so many lives for the fear that so many people are experiencing. We despair at the violence in the world. We feel angry, angry at the injustice we see and experience, angry at police brutality, angry at racism, our hearts are with our friends in Ferguson and St. Louis who are demonstrating for justice this weekend. We are sad as we mourn our personal losses, mourn friends and family without whom our lives will never be the same. And we delight in being together, in friendship, in partnership, in community. We look at the blue sky after the rain and the leaves beginning to turn a deep red on the trees and we stumble over chestnuts newly fallen on the walk and we feel blessed. All of these things fit into our small and bulging hearts this morning and we ask for these few moments of quiet to honor all that is, the joy and the heartbreak, the sadness and the hope. We offer all these things to our worship and meditation this morning. Amen. I invited my mother Lynn to give our reading this morning. The Kindness of Lomaine. My friend Marcy and her boyfriend Brian recently ate dinner at a local Chinese restaurant. As they enjoyed a plate of Lomaine engrossed in conversation, a hand reached down and ushered away their platter of noodles. A voice quick and agitated mumbled, Sorry and a thin, poorly dressed woman left the restaurant with their plate of lo mein. In astonishment, they watched her walk down the street, holding the plate with the flat of her hand as she stuffed noodles into her mouth, slapping sharply against her face. The owner realized what had happened and darted out the front door, chasing after the noodle thief. He stood firmly in front of her, blocking her way, and grabbing a side of the plate. A struggle ensued. Noodles slid uneasily from one side to the other, slopping over the edge. He surged forward and pulled with a heroic strong arm attempt to retrieve his plate. The woman's fingers slid from the plate. Noodles flew, then flopped pathetically on the sidewalk. Left empty-handed 
with soggy, contaminated noodles at her feet. The woman stood with arms hung dejectedly at her side. The owner walked victoriously back to the restaurant with a soiled plate in hand. My friends were given a new heaping plate of lo mein, although they had already consumed half of the stolen plate. A stream of apology in Chinese came from the proprietor. Unable to eat anymore, they asked to have the noodles wrapped up and set off to see their movie. A block later, they happened upon the lo mein thief. The woman was hypercharged. She simultaneously cried, convulsed, and shouted at a man who rapidly retreated from her side. My friend, unsure about what to do, listened to her boyfriend's plea to just walk away. But she didn't. Instead, she walked over to the thief and said, ah, we haven't formally met, but about 10 minutes ago, you were interested in our noodles. They gave us some new ones. Are you still hungry? The woman nodded and extended her bony arms. She took the styrofoam container in her hands, bowed ever so slightly, and murmured, thank you, you're very kind. What makes us walk away from discomfort or stay? You could say a lot about my friend's story, a lot about generosity, kindness, attention, and thievery. I'm more interested in what motivates us to confront that which makes us uncomfortable and makes us look at the guts and grit of decisions, the choices to not address things that are uncomfortable, uneasy, unbalanced, unnatural, unbelievable. When our foundations start to shake, we can feel the tremors move up our legs and into our torsos. And we want more than anything to make it stop. Anyhow anyway. My friend Marcy could feel herself shake. I know because she told me so. But she chose not to walk away. She dealt with uncomfortableness. She held firm in the muck. Sometimes that's all we need or can do to get to the other side. The side where generosity comfort and kindness reside. The side where foundations are firm and stable, where one's shaking walks back to the other side. At first, when Sister Simone Campbell and four other Catholic nuns boarded a chartered bus in 2012 with a plan to travel cross country, to protest the Ryan budget, which would decimate programs meant to help people in need, people thought they were a bit nutty. Even Sister Simone herself wasn't sure if this really was a good idea or if anything would come of it, if it would change anything. But she felt compelled to try. Trying to make meaningful change in the world had by this time become integral to her faith life, her calling. She couldn't not do it. It was Judith Moyers, Bill Moyers' wife, who first saw that this bus trip was really going to be something. She insisted that her husband send a full-time photographer and videographer on the bus. Andy Fredericks was the videographer and toward the end of that first trip, during one of the taping sessions, Andy said to Sister Simone, Sister Simone, it seems like whenever there's trouble, you walk towards it. Most people run away. 
Sister Simone had to admit that that was a pretty accurate assessment. She does tend to walk toward trouble. But that idea didn't bother her. The idea that bothered her more was the other truth in his statement. Most people run away. Sister Simone Campbell is a coordinator of Network, a national Catholic social justice lobby. In Washington, she lobbies on issues of peace building, immigration reform, health care, and economic justice. During the 2010 congressional debate about health care reform, she wrote the famous Nuns Letter, supporting the Affordable Care Act, and President Obama invited her to the ceremony celebrating its being signed into law. By now, she's most well known for her Nuns on the Bus campaign. And because of that, Sister Simone was chosen by Unitarian Universalists to present the 2014 Ware Lecture at General Assembly in Providence this past summer. Some of you were there. The Dunkin' Donuts Arena in Providence was nearly full as thousands of you used gathered to hear her words. She got a kick out of us. She really did. Remember that her religious context is quite different than ours, and of course, in some ways, similar. But remember that part of what sparked the nuns on the bus tour, other than an urgent need to shine light on issues facing the poor, was the smallness being demonstrated at the time by the Catholic hierarchy. You might recall that the Vatican had just issued an eight-page document addressed to the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, the major association of American nuns. This doctrinal assessment accused the nuns of radical feminism, <laughs> of agitating for women's ordination, and of remaining silent in the lively public debate about abortion and euthanasia in the United States. As a remedy, the Vatican ordered a five-year rehabilitation <laughs> during which the nuns would be supervised by a committee of three bishops. The nuns were not pleased. <laughs> they fought back, and nuns on the bus, I have to believe, was part of that. After the initial bus ride, 200 sisters rode the Staten Island Ferry for a Nuns on the Ferry rally. <laughs> In 2013, there was another national tour for immigration reform. Bus rides this year are happening to bring attention to midterm elections. But things have changed dramatically in the Catholic world with the new Pope, Pope Francis. Sister Simone loves him. Actually, during her talk, she called him Pope Frank. <laughs> because, she says, he's pretty cool. But although she is better received by the Vatican now, it's important to remember that when she first boarded that bus, Sister Simone wasn't just walking toward trouble in the American political realm. She was also walking toward trouble within her faith community within her tradition, hoping to make some changes there as well. I guess that's what some people call radical feminism. <laughs> but it was also her Catholic faith that was driving her to be an activist. Her faith had taught her to be an activist, sustained her in her activism, informs her deepest beliefs about people and how they should be treated and why we are here. She says, there's a part of me that has always believed that we can make a difference. And she calls walking toward trouble a journey of faith. When you think about it, she said, all of our spiritual leaders, when there are broken hearts or pain in our world, they have walked towards it. They walk toward the pain in order to embrace, touch, heal, now that means if leaders do that, isn't that the witness we all want to try to follow? Now it's not only nuns that walk toward trouble. 
I was interested in this next story because it involves a lobster boat, and you know that my dad is a lobsterman. In May 2013, Ken Ward and Jay O'Hara used a little white lobster boat, the Henry David T, to block a shipment of 40,000 tons of coal to the Brayton Point Power Station in Somerset, Massachusetts, the largest coal plant in New England. They were charged with conspiracy, disturbing the peace, and motor vessel violations and they faced several years in jail. Ken and Jay sought to become the first American climate activists to use a necessity defense, arguing that the blockade was necessary in light of the imminent threat of climate change. And you know what? Their bravery paid off. Just a few weeks ago, the Bristol County District Attorney dropped the conspiracy charges and reduced the other charges to civil infractions, saying that he saw the need to take leadership on climate change. He called climate change one of the gravest crises our planet ever faced, and he told a cheering crowd that he would join them at the People's Climate March in New York City. Jay O'Hara, one of the activists, is a Quaker, and it is his Quaker faith that led him to walk towards trouble. The truth is, he said, is that taking these sorts of actions is necessary in the light of the drastic news that continues to be described by science. This decision by the district attorney is an admission that the political and economic system isn't taking the climate crisis seriously and that it falls to ordinary citizens, especially people of faith, to stand up and take action to avert catastrophe. Ken and Jay's blockade sparked a summer of action at the Brayton Point, including the arrest of 44 people at the gates of the plant. That fall, the owners announced the closure of Brayton Point in 2017. I can also think of countless times when you, members of this congregation, have been moved by your own faith to walk towards trouble. I love hearing those stories. And I thank Pastor Brenda Haywood for sharing this next story with me. In 1997, Reverend Fred Phelps of the Westboro Baptist Church came to Provincetown fueled with hatred and bigotry, to attack Provincetown's newly established anti-bias school education program, a program that was developed by the school committee and various organizations of our community to teach our students tolerance, regardless of race, sexual orientation, or religious affiliation. Reverend Phelps felt that we were teaching our children to be homosexuals and devil worshipers. Reverend Phelps and his crew were able to get permission to come here by citing their First Amendment rights to voice and demonstrate their viewpoint. Provincetown didn't have the choice to ban them from being here, but we did have a choice as to how the town would respond. It was decided by a community town meeting and the interfaith communities to present a peaceful response. The churches held a silent candlelit community peace march from St. Mary's down Commercial Street to our front lawn where prayers were offered for a peaceful and hate-free community response the next day. Fred Phelps and friends arrived and occupied the Bow Relief area on Bradford Street. Pastor Brenda and Betty Comey and others organized a peacekeepers group which included more than 30 townspeople wearing peacekeepers t-shirts and yellow ribbons. They stationed themselves across the street from the Phelps demonstrators along with our police force. It was a nonviolent demonstration but crude language and anti-gay signs were shown by the Phelps family testing the resolve of the townspeople to be peaceful. But the peacekeepers didn't run from it. They walked toward it, providing a buffer zone so that others would not need to be in fear. 
after the Phelps family left, they tend to leave if they don't get that much attention. The whole community continued to display the yellow peace ribbons to celebrate unity. I can think of other examples of you walking towards trouble. Some of you even acted out examples from history during the most dangerous women play. Some of you participated in ACT UP during the AIDS crisis to bring much needed resources to find a cure and medications that worked as friends were dying. Diane Turco of the Cape Downwinders and nine other Cape Cod residents were arrested this year for trespassing on the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant property as they attempted to deliver a letter to the owner of the energy plant, calling upon them to shut it down because it is unsafe. They knew what would happen, but they walked toward trouble to stand up for what they believed in. When I talk about walking towards trouble, though, I'm not just talking about these public acts of civil disobedience that can potentially get us thrown in jail. I'm also talking about a thousand smaller moments that happen within the course of our regular days. Moments we may not have prepared for or called in backup or lawyers for. Moments that there are no press kits to utilize. Just our own judgment in the moment. Like Karen's friend giving her lo mein noodles to a stranger who scared her a little bit. I need to provide a caveat here. I have the voice of my dad in the back of my head. He's a lobsterman, but also a therapist. Remember Patch Adams? He always told his social work interns. It's sad to think about that movie now that Robin Williams has died, but it has always been a bittersweet story anyway. You remember it? The young med student moved by Patch's insistence that one treat both the body and the spirit, and that doctors must bond with their patients, tries to help a mentally disturbed patient. She goes to him alone and is killed by that man. A sobering reminder that openness sometimes comes with consequences. So I guess I'm asking you to balance two callings that are both very real. To pay heed to your own personal safety and to walk towards trouble. Maybe you think doing both is impossible, but I know that we need both to change the world. We need to take care of ourselves and we need to take care of others. We need to set boundaries, and we need to break through barriers. We need to be smart, and we need to be bold, courageous, wild. We need to heed that voice in our gut, but we need to block out the voices of those who would try to keep us small or make us behave. Sister Simone says, I do this because of faith. I do this because I am challenged to radically accept everyone. Because every time I let my heart be broken open and hear a new story, I hear something new. Sister Simone says, if we're going to walk towards trouble, then what we have to do is find a way to stand side by side where we look at the problem together where we try to define the problem with everyone's story. And if everyone's story is in the mix, we're halfway to solving that problem. Because then we can see where the commonalities are. Then we can see who's left out. Then we can invite more people in. Sister Simone says, what I have discovered is that when you walk towards community, we become deeply aware of the truth that we're in this together, that we are not separate, that there is no real discernible difference when you get right down to it. 
We may have different stories to tell, but it's the same hunger, the same desire, the same passion to make a difference in our world, to care for family, to be who we are called to be. If you walk towards trouble, she says, you'll have a lot of people walking with you if you do it together. And that is the way it can be done. May it be so. Amen and blessed be.